little slow on the pitch change there. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Yeah, it's a privilege to be with you uh, this morning up here. If we've not met, my name is Chris Carter, and I'm the Minister of Connections here at North Point. It's really a privilege to get to do that role and that job. I get to spend my days thinking about discipleship and how we actually figure out system-wise and people-wise how we become uh, uh, more devoted followers towards Jesus and those kinds of things. So if we haven't met before... There you go. All right, good stuff. Uh, I, I want, I want, I don't know how to, here we go, cool. When was the last time you wrote a letter? I mean, I don't know how to get into that thought, but this is the thought. When was the last time you wrote a letter? I'm not talking an email. I'm not talking a text or a tweet or a Facebook post or whatever social media gets you going in the morning. But an actual letter, like you took a pen, do you remember what that is? And you put it to a piece of paper and you wrote, words that you had to spell correctly. And then, and, then, and then you caught yourself doing that dumb thing where you knew you spelled it wrong, but you punched the piece of paper, trying to get spell check to pop up, and you're like, I'm an idiot. Anybody else do that? Just me, cool. Um, so when was the last time you wrote a, a letter? Like, we don't do this much anymore, which I think is why it can be so powerful when we do write letters. My, my wife and I, Emily and I, started a marriage enrichment program through North Point uh, a year ago or so called Funner Marriage. And um, as uh, par part of that, and it's designed for marriages, not marriages that are in crisis, but really marriages that are doing pretty well. And it sort of just functions like a tune-up, like you might on your car. You know, your car's running pretty well, but if you change that oil every 3,000 miles, that car will go through 100,000 miles. But if you just don't ever touch it ever, it seems to like fall apart slowly over time. We're looking for marriages that are doing pretty well and really just... Uh, uh, kind of weigh in on those and, and, and do that little oil changer tuna. But as part of that marriage ministry, we committed to going to a marriage retreat once a year, just participate in that, not lead it, but just participate. We were there last weekend, my wife and I, and as one of the uh, activities they had us do, they, the uh, facilitators had us pick 10 adjectives off of a list of like 100 adjectives for a word guy like me, that's incredibly hard to pick 10. It's not even fair. And then take those 10 and write um, a spouse a little note. And Emily did the same thing. Now, that might sound kind of hokey to you. And frankly, I sat in the back of the room thinking this is really hokey. But really powerful in that we just don't write to people anymore. We don't write letters. We don't write cards. It's just not something that we do. Uh, at, at one of our funner marriages retreats that we lead, we had a couple that had been married for 40 years uh, share with us that their, uh, their habit every anniversary, every Valentine's Day, was they would go to the grocery store together, Walmart, Meyer, whatever, go to the card aisle. They would pick a card out for each other, swap it right there in the aisle. Hallmark's going to get so ticked at this right now. They would read those cards and then put them right back on the shelf. And I thought, this is genius. It's like zero cost letter writing, and they are happily married for 40-something years. I think that's really cool. Uh, a letter writing tradition that Emily and I have adopted over the years is every Halloween, uh, it's, Halloween is technically All Saints Eve, right? The next day is All Saints Day or All Hallows Eve. We call Halloween All Hallows Eve. Saints Day is next day. If you don't know, it's cool. Uh, and, and, and the idea is on Halloween, we sit down, we figure out a, a person or a couple that has been like a, a significant spiritual influence in our life over the last year. Sometimes we do that individually, you know, someone who's been individually significant in our lives and sometimes as a couple. And we write them a letter, like paper, pen, letter, because we recognize emails are just different. Emails are so common for us. We write them a letter and we send it to them. And our thinking is that we always say nice things about people at their funeral, which is a really silly time to do that because they don't get to hear. We thought, how cool is it for people to hear that they've had some kind of an influence on our lives uh, bef before they die, when it doesn't happen at their funeral? The, the incredibly powerful concept of writing someone a letter. If you get nothing else out of this morning, maybe you just take that away, right? So if you're looking like, hey, when can I nap? Now's the time, all right? But just hear the importance of writing letters. Maybe you'd walk out with that. But why are we talking about letters this morning? Why do we start with that? Well, we begin a brand new series this morning from the book of Colossians. We're calling this series Colossians. I know, right? It's huge, like super creative, but instead of some catchy title or whatever, we really just want to let the text speak for itself. And so that's where we're at this morning. And Colossians is a letter. 
It's a letter written by a pastor who was super encouraged by a church he hadn't even really met yet. And we're going to pick that up over the next couple of months as we jump into it. So hopefully you've got a Bible this morning. Open that to Colossians chapter 1. We're just going to be in the first few verses. If you don't have a Bible, the verses will be in the app, and they'll pop up on the screen behind me. But hopefully you've got a copy of the scriptures, uh, and that way you can uh, underline, highlight, circle, doggy ear pages, all that kind of stuff. Before we jump into the first chapter, I just want to tell you a couple things about Colossians. And I know if you're not history buffs, this is a challenge you might tune out, but just hang with me like, for like one minute of just a little bit about this place called Colossae, because we're not really familiar with it. Colossae is the city name. It sits at this crucial crossroads in what they call the Lycos River Valley in modern-day Turkey. And so that's, that's, that's what you got going on in your brain, kind of that area of the world. This major crossroads, crossroads but this, this, this town of Colossae had become the least significant of three towns that were at these crossroads, coupled with Laodicea. Some of you guys that are Bible scholars, you're like, hey, I think that pops up later in the Bible. It does. And then Hierapolis. These three cities were really, really important and powerful. But in uh, 17 AD, there was an earthquake. It destroyed Colossae. They rebuilt it, but it never really got back to its full oomph. So it became kind of this... Um, once was a really powerful city and had really been kind of downgraded to town status because of some failing industry, because of some infrastructure breakdown, because of some economic issues. Is this sounding any familiar? This really, I didn't say it. Just for the record on video, I didn't say that, all right? But it's interesting because this little city, this little town, it was full of Gentiles, had lots of pagan influence. There were some Jewish folks there as well, but for the most part, we're talking non-Jewish people. Written by a guy named Paul, this letter to this church in this town of Colossae was written by a guy named Paul. Some of you know him, some of you are like, who? Uh, Paul, it's interesting that Paul, who, who, who really becomes prominent in the New Testament for writing much of our New Testament, would write a letter to a little kind of podunk, nothing church in a little town. Sort of interesting. We get in our culture hung up so much on mega church and large and, and glitz and what we see on TV and those kinds of things. And yet Paul was very comfortable writing to this little place with this expectation that Colossae would read this letter to the church and then they would pass it on to the other places in that area, Laodicea, Hierapolis, those kinds of places, and, and kind of circulate that letter around. Paul wrote to Colossae because he had three friends in that church. And we find this out through the book. Uh, one guy's name is Epaphras. That guy probably founded the church. Uh, he is the one who tells Paul about what's going on in the church that prompts this letter. We'll talk about it in a second. There was a guy named Philemon. Philemon of the Philemon book of the Bible fame. There's another book of the Bible just a couple books later letter uh, to a guy named Philemon. And Philemon was this businessman who had a slave who had run away, and that slave was returning. And Paul is writing to him saying, hey, this is how this should function as you accept this brother in Christ back, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ, which would have been like a revolutionary concept back in the day. And so you've got Epaphras, you've got Philemon, and then you've got a third guy named Onesimus. Onesimus is that slave that's coming back that we hear more about in the book of Philemon. But these three folks were part of the church in Colossae. And so not only is there one letter written to this little podunk town, Colossians, but a second letter, Philemon. That's fascinating to me that Paul would just find it important enough to write to this little church in this little town that didn't seem to have tons of, of stuff going on for it, but had some things happening around it. So Paul writes this letter based on what he had heard from Epaphras, right? To celebrate and encourage the Colossians. You'll get that sense as you read through it. Paul's kind of excited about some of the things that they're doing. But also he sees some stuff on the forefront coming that are dangerous to the way that they believe. And he wants to send them warning about that. Not to get distracted from the true gospel. Not to get lost in this, this other gospel that's not true. And so Paul wants to give them some challenge some encouragement, some hope in that. As we read through Colossians, and our ask to you, my, my ask to you and to me, is that we would actually read this throughout the week. It's four chapters. It's short. Like, you could read that in, like, as quick as you can read, or you could stretch that out because you're a word guy like me and start digging in deeply, which is cool, but that you would read that a few times each week. We'll come back together on Sunday and unpack pieces of it. Here's the three things that I think are important that we look for as we're reading through that. Number one is what's actually going on in the Colossian church. Like, Paul's pretty clear. There are definitely some things to celebrate, and Paul points those out. 
And there's probably some application to our own lives as we think about what's happening in the church in Colossae. But also there are some cautions about belief and theology that Paul throws in there and he wants them to understand. And these things are pivotal to how you understand salvation. I mean, they're not just like throwaway thoughts or different ideas or I don't like that. These are pivotal to how we think, how the church in Colossae thought and how we think about salvation. Paul points these out really clearly. Second thing we wanna look out for is what really constitutes false teaching. Paul is gonna mention this concept of false teaching over and over again, but what does that really mean? In our culture, we use that phrase false teaching, or we like to call it fake news. <laughs> fake news, right? We throw that out really quick and really loud, and often we just use it to refer to something we don't like. But just because we don't like it doesn't make it false teaching. When, when a pastor or, or a book or something you're reading says this, and you're like, I don't like that, that's, that's false teaching, right? And now you're against it. Uh, maybe pause and think, is it? How, how do I know? What, what is false teaching exactly? Uh, Paul, he doesn't function in the quick to call out false teaching thing. He, he takes that as serious. So he lays out specific and general things that go against the true gospel. And he exhorts the church not to get wrapped in those false things. And then the third thing, maybe the most important thing, as you are reading through Colossians, you're gonna look for this concept of Christ's supremacy over everything. It's a major theme for Paul, as he writes this letter on a piece of paper and puts his name at the bottom, he wants this small church and sort of this um, t town that has seen better days in an area where there are better towns to understand that Christ is supreme over everything, over creation, over rulers, over authority, over the church, and over believers. So Paul makes this big deal about that. And you're going to see that there. these are not like hidden things. You don't have to know like, where's Waldo? It's pretty simple. It's right in the text. And so this concept that comes up over and over again about Christ's supremacy. Okay, enough. Is that enough history for now? Let's jump into the text. Chapter one, starting at verse one. I just want to read the first eight verses, and that's where we'll camp this morning. This is what it says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who has also told us of your love in the Spirit. That's where we'll pause for this morning. Verses one and two, you, if you've read these letters of Paul, this is pretty standard greeting stuff for Paul. He, he says hello to the church. He's talking about who's with him. But in verse two, we have this really interesting word. It says to God's holy people. That, that phrase holy people is the phrase saints. Paul is saying to the saints in Colossae. That word holy was usually reserved for Jewish people and Jewish things. Those people that had been considered part of God's economy was not really used of Gentiles. And here Paul is using it of a predominantly Gentile group, a non-Jewish group, as if, as if Paul is saying, you too, Gentiles, are part of God's economy. You are also God's people. I think he's foreshadowing what's coming in chapter 2 becomes part of a bigger problem that these guys are gonna be struggling with. And we have it starting all the way in verse two, this idea that these guys are also saints in Colossae. Verses three and four, Paul is just effusive, right? We always thank God. These are important words. We, we always thank God when we pray for you. It's like every pastor's dream, right? As they think of the church that they shepherd, to just be so thankful for God's love prominently displayed in the church and outside of the church as people come to a relationship with Jesus that like changes who they are from the inside and changes lives and families and communities and workplaces and sports teams. Paul is so excited and he, he just wants to share that with them. Down to verse 7 and 8, and we, that's where we meet for the first time this guy named Epaphras. This was the, the initiator of this true gospel with the Colossians. He probably founded the church there, and somehow there's communication between Paul and this guy. And this guy is saying, hey, you got to hear about my church. Like, these people are just 
like rocking it. They're doing it. It's so exciting. I love being with them. Let me tell you some stories. And Paul is just excited. Verses four through six is where I want to finish up this morning and spend the next couple of minutes because it's really interesting stuff. It's this idea in verse four. It says, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up from you. The, the message version of the Bible, which is kind of a paraphrase based on original languages and just uses different words, it says it this way. It says, the lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. See, in, in English, we give the word hope a little bit of a bad rap. We often use the word hope um, the, the, the way I think about the mail, you know, like USPS, like, boy, I hope my letter gets here today. <laughs> boy, I hope my package gets there today. You know what I mean? Like, you don't really know. Like, you, you're hoping it shows up at some point. That's, that's kind of how we think of the word hope. But the word hope in the Bible is a different word. It, it's, it's more like Amazon, where, where when you get that little notification on your phone, it says, your package is 10 stops away. And like your heart, you're with me, right? Your heart rate goes, you're just, oh, right? And then you click on it and you open it and you follow that little truck. It's like nine stops away, eight stops away. And you're just, oh, six, st three stops away, oh, two stops away. And bing, it's here. And you run outside like the adult ice cream truck. <laughs> it's here, right? And the poor Amazon guy gets freaked out. Hope is that sense of knowing that it's coming and anticipating its arrival. That's pretty powerful, right? So that's the biblical word for hope. We use the word in English differently, but the biblical word is a powerful thing, the confident expectation that God will fulfill a promise. And it's the very thing, it's this false ideology that you'll see in a couple chapters that's creeping into this church, and it's attacking that very thing. It's attacking the hope that these Gentiles had. That, that, that what they had going in their faith in Jesus was all that they needed, but this, this junk is creeping in saying, nah, nah, there's a couple more things you need as well. And that's what we'll see starting in chapter two. But this word hope is powerful, and it's interesting because, because Paul uses this trilogy of faith, hope, and love over and over and over again in his letters. It's like these three things are linked because these three things are linked. Faith, hope, and love. You can find this in a bunch of places, and if you're looking for some kind of a word study to do in your own devotions as you're working through Colossians, that might be a great thing to research. Just, just Google or BibleGateway.com, you know, faith, hope, and love in the Bible, and you'll find all these passages that use that trilogy. Just, just one as an example, uh, just so you can see it, is in a chapter that's probably really familiar to us, 1 Corinthians 13. If you go to a wedding, it's hard to not go to a wedding where they don't use this verse. It's the great love passage, love is patient, Love is kind, does not envy, hopes, all that stuff, right? It's making some sense, 1 Corinthians 13. Well, that passage, Paul, same author, is describing with lots of words what this concept of love is. And then after he puts out all those descriptors, he says that love is the thing that'll last. It's the thing that's gonna continue on. Lots of other things will end or fade away, but love continues. And then he says that we don't really fully understand all this now because we're not finished maturing yet. I'm just doing a setup because I wanna get you to verse 12. We're not fully mature yet. We're not fully there yet. But one day we will be after we die and meet Jesus, stand eyeball to eyeball. And we'll have it all figured out. But until then, it's kind of fuzzy. And then in verse 12, again, the message version of 1 Corinthians 13, he says this. He says, we don't see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. There's that trilogy. It says uh, trust, which is really faith, faith in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and that's what leads us to maturity. You could spend lots of time digging through all these places that the faith, love, hope trilogy pops up. Incredibly important. And in Colossae, this like right out the chute, the first thing that Paul wants the Colossian church to be reminded of is the importance that this faith they have in Jesus and the love they have from people stems from this hope that they have, not, 
not a USPS kind of hope, but like an Amazon kind of like, like it's coming and I know it's coming and that compels me to act and live in certain ways. It's an amazing thing. And that hope in the gospel that leads the Colossians to that faith and love is powerful. It's the same hope in the gospel that in verse uh, six, Paul says, is happening all over the place. Like, not just you, little Colossae, but all, he says, all over the world. Pro probably not the entire world. This is Paul speaking like a pastor with this exaggeration language. Like, it's happening everywhere. Everywhere the gospel is, it's not only powerful, but it's expansive as well. Colossians, this morning, in the book over the next couple months, talks a ton about the gospel. And, and it begs the question, when you think about this concept of the gospel, what does that mean for you? Like, do you know the gospel? We, we use that phrase a lot. We, we, when we want to convince somebody we're telling them the truth, we say, that's the gospel truth, right? We, we throw that word in there. Or we talk about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We go, oh, we should read the gospels, right? Uh, we have gospel music, which is a whole another. So we have this word, but, but what does it mean when we think about as Christ followers, the gospel? If you look it up, you know, you probably, well, that means the good news. It does. The word means the good news of, of Jesus and all he's done. Cool. If you had to write down the gospel definition on a napkin, could you? Or in your mind, is it so complicated? It's so complex. I couldn't write it on a napkin. I think you can put it on a napkin. But, but something that challenges us in 2022, in DeWitt, St. John's, Lansing, Langsburg, Ovid, Grand Ledge, Wakusa, Michigan, is that there are so many false gospels. And, and maybe false is a little strong. Maybe we'd call it incomplete gospels. But I'm going to use the word false because I, I want us to hear it. I want us to hear it that way. There are a number of false gospels. Some examples, one would be the shame gospel. These are not by like, other religions, by the way. These are like within Christianity where folks that would say that they're Christ followers or churches that would say that, that, that they are all about Jesus. They, they promote these false, incomplete gospels. The shame gospel. The shame gospel sounds like this. You're a dirty, rotten scoundrel desperately in need of saving. Stop sinning, get fixed, become a Christian. I like to sometimes let the pauses just be awkward because you're like, I don't, is that, is that funny or not funny? I don't know that, but I feel that. The shame gospel is, is this idea that you are dirty and rotten at your core, and it's not, it's not totally wrong. It's not totally off. We, we are sinners. We need saving, but the problem with it is that it doesn't go back far enough. It doesn't start back far enough. It like starts in the middle of the movie, and so it doesn't make sense, and it tends to hurt people. Another false gospel that would, would be the savior-only gospel. It might sound like this. Uh, you need to accept Jesus as your savior so you don't go to hell. You only avoid hell if you're saved by praying your prayer, walking down an aisle, filling out a card, whatever. Now, it's, not, it's not totally wrong. There's some pieces that are accurate. Hell is a real place. It's where people outside of a relationship with Jesus spend eternity. But it doesn't address the bigger problem. And it doesn't address what happens between now and then. So like, oh, okay, well, I, I accept Jesus as my Savior. Sweet, I'm going to go to heaven one day. Woo, now what? You just wait for you know, our high school graduates, you know, 18. Wait for 70 years? <laughs> what, what then? What do I do now? See, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't address that question. Here's another gospel that we get caught up in sometimes, the all roads lead to heaven Gospel, you've heard this. I know you have. It's been your brother-in-law or your uncle or your cousin or someone that says, if you're a good person, you'll end up in heaven. And, and the problem is that not all good people go to heaven. There's lots of good people that I don't think end up there. Right? There's lots of roads that lead to Jesus. That might be true. There's lots of paths. I love sitting over coffee with people and hearing their story uh, on how they met Jesus. And, and one person grew up this way and did this stuff. And one person grew up this way and did this stuff. There's all kinds of roads that lead to Jesus. But Jesus is pretty clear that there's only one way that leads to right relationship with God, this thing that we would call heaven. Right? There's, there's this false gospel uh, called the buddy Jesus gospel, if you've seen that movie, good for you. Um, it usually sounds like this, like God and I are good. They usually phrase it as the big man upstairs and I are good. You've definitely heard this from your brother-in-law. 
Or they finish it with, I'm not as bad as that guy over there, fill in a name of some really horrible guy that created all kinds of atrocities in history. So God's cool with me, even if I don't do all that Christian stuff. And I don't even know where to start with that. <laughs> That's not even close to the stuff that Jesus talked about when he was on the earth for three years, let alone the entirety of scripture. Or, or maybe a false gospel sounds like this. I, I'd call it American gospel number one, don't shoot me. It, it says um, this, we just need to get back to our conservative roots, good moral values, solid family values, and vote correctly. So the, the true, beautiful, and good gospel is above conservative or liberal, it's above country nation, it's above assigned cultural morals, and it's outside of family origin. So maybe, maybe it sounds like this, I call this American gospel number two because there's multiple versions of this. This good American gospel. That might sound like this. If you just put your head down and work really hard, you'll be okay. Get a spouse, 2.5 kids, house in the burbs, two cars, double income, 401k, etc. Just keep yourself busy with work, family, and church. You'll be fine. But what if it's not? What if it's not fine? What if God has other plans for your family or not? What if God has different plans for your income or not? Your house or not? Your 401k or not? Your cars or not? Etc. Etc. Or not? What if the American dream isn't God's dream for us? American gospel number two. So then what is the true gospel, the true, good, beautiful gospel of Jesus? This is how I would put it. I just wanna read it to you. It's in your app if you have the app because I want you to see it. And it might sound like this. In the beginning, we were created whole and healthy. We were designed for relationship with God and each other. Everything was good and beautiful and true. We were whole. And choices were made to choose a different path. No longer aligning with God and the wholeness he created for us, but choosing to align with death and lesser voices. We were broken, distant from God, distant from others, distant from self. And we tried to fill that brokenness, fill that void, fill the distance with myriad of things. Sex, love, distraction, work, Busyness, religion, rule, shame, medication, etc., 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 and none of it worked. So we just tried a different fix for way too many seasons. Then Jesus, Jesus came into the world, our space, and offers something different to fill the void, fix the problem, close the distance. It has little to do with what I can do, and much to do with what He's already done on the earth, from the cross, out of the grave, is life, death, burial, resurrection, and my hope in that makes me right with God. Not just a promise of heaven eventually, but heaven right now, in the kingdom, with the king, whole, healthy, happy, with God, with others, with self, the gospel, the good, beautiful, and true gospel. See, this is what the Colossians knew. This is what they had great hope and faith in. It, it, it produces the kind of hope that springs up from somewhere deep inside of us. See, we're gonna have a great time over the next couple months working through this book of Colossians, this ancient letter that's so relevant for today, it could have been written yesterday. And my prayer for us is that it causes hope that leads to faith in Jesus and love for people to spring up in us. Amen.